Once upon a time, there was an aspiring graduate student in theoretical physics. As he was about to complete his dissertation, he took a university course on the history of science. Here, for the first time, he took a step back from his technical concerns and instead began to look at science like an onion. He wanted to learn how this onion looks like on the inside. As he peeled away layer after layer, he uncovered the central part of the onion. Stunned, he took a closer look. What he found disproved everything he thought he knew about science. So let's all gather around the center of this onion and have a look at the curiosities that make science tick. Science, for all its flaws, is the only tool for understanding the nature of reality that has any kind of track record whatsoever. The others have just a story to tell. The Buddhist story, the Jesus story, fine stories, but all they have is a rap. Why is science different? Somebody could say, but isn't it just a rap? It is, but it plays by slightly different rules than these other explanatory systems. Science is the only explanatory system where you get points for proving you are wrong. The advent of consciousness started many peculiar endeavors of the human species. People started to engage in all sorts of pursuits, from telling cosmic tales at the campfire to researching the best TikTok recipe for a green goddess salad. Our curiosity has led us to strange places. But there is one obsession that runs like a golden thread throughout human history. The thirst for knowledge. This urge has driven man into the successful enterprise of science. The history of science is as old as curiosity itself. But not until the 19th century we started to practice what we call modern science today. Since then, scientific investigation has been an unparalleled success story. At a staggering pace, we are lifting the world's mysteries, one after another. Ever more rapidly does the unknown turn into explored territory. Each insight can be added to the increasing body of scientific knowledge. Loose ends seem to be just a matter of time. Sooner or later, they'll all be tied up by the relentlessness of scientific progress. And this is all thanks to the scientific method of rationality and reason. This formula for success consists of systematic observation and experimentation, inductive and deductive reasoning, and the formation and testing of hypotheses and theories. One important feature of a scientific hypothesis is that we can formulate precise findings that would falsify it. This criterion is called falsifiability. Falsifiability ensures transparent reasoning and weeds out nebulous concepts. In so far as the scientific statement speaks about reality, it must be falsifiable. And in so far as it is not falsifiable, it does not speak about reality. At least, this is the story we tell about science. But if you investigate its history, this heroic story displays some major plot holes. So let's meet the man who discovered them. Normal science, the activity in which most scientists inevitably spend almost all their time, is predicated on the assumption that the scientific community knows what the world is like. Much of the success of the enterprise derives from the community's willingness to defend that assumption, if necessary, at considerable cost. Thomas Kuhn started off as a graduate student in theoretical physics. He was about to finish his dissertation as he enrolled into a university course on the history of science. To my complete surprise, that exposure to out-of-date scientific theory and practice radically undermined some of my basic conceptions about the nature of science and the reasons for its special success. As he delved into the historical context of scientific development, he noticed a great discrepancy between the chaotic and irrational procedure of scientific investigation and the sober and linear image of modern science. That image has previously been drawn, even by scientists themselves, mainly from the study of finished scientific achievements, as these are recorded in the classics and textbooks from which each new scientific generation learns to practice its trade. Inevitably, however, the aim of such books is persuasive and pedagogic. The concept of science drawn from them is no more likely to fit the enterprise that produced them than an image of a national culture drawn from a tourist brochure or a language text. This notion of linear scientific progress was nowhere to be found. Instead, he discovered that the scientific enterprise unfolds within two phases. Periods of normal science and interruptions by scientific revolutions. Normal science is conducted only within an existing paradigm. A paradigm is like a worldview which rests upon a few basic assumptions. Ptolemian physics served for centuries as a paradigm and placed the Earth in the center of the universe. For a long time, scientists did their research only within the conceptual boundaries of this paradigm. This is what normal science is all about. 
to align all their investigations and findings with the currently valid paradigm. That enterprise seems an attempt to force nature into the preformed and relatively inflexible box that the paradigm supplies. No part of the aim of normal science is to call forth new sorts of phenomena. Indeed, those that will not fit the box are often not seen at all. Normal scientific research is directed to the articulation of those phenomena and theories that the paradigm already supplies. As long as science advances within the framework of one paradigm, scientific progress proceeds as it is claimed by the heroic image. Bit by bit, mysteries are unraveled and the scientific progress looks cumulative. Meanwhile, everything that is conducted beyond the paradigm's conceptions is disregarded as non-scientific. This is because a paradigm serves for time implicitly to define the legitimate problems and methods of a research field for succeeding generations of practitioners. Under normal conditions, the research scientist is not an innovator, but a solver of puzzles. And the puzzles upon which he concentrates are just those which he believes can be both stated and solved within the existing scientific tradition. But what if there are findings that refute the assumption of the established paradigm? Isn't the hallmark of science that it discards a paradigm as soon as it is falsified? Well, that is at least the tale we tell in retrospective. But what scientists actually do looks quite different. In science, novelty emerges only with difficulty, manifested by resistance against a background provided by expectation. Finding an anomaly does not create a circular calling for a paradigm shift. An analysis of the history of science shows that the basic assumptions of a paradigm are surrounded by a more comprehensive network than the term hypothesis would suggest. In theory, a hypothesis can be refuted in the blink of an eye. If it is, all swans are white, the confirmed observation of a black specimen is enough to disprove it. However, this process has nothing to do with scientific practice. In fact, a hypothesis is only the tip of the iceberg. It forms the hard core of paradigm. This core is defended by a protective belt of auxiliary hypotheses that explain anomalies without having to change the hard core. In addition, a paradigm has a heuristic. It functions as a problem-solving machine and neutralizes anomalies by mathematical means. An example of a paradigm is Newtonian physics. The three laws of mechanics and the law of gravity form the core of this paradigm. One possible anomaly would be if a planet were to move contrary to Newton's predictions. In such a case, the hypothesis regarding atmospheric refraction, the propagation of light in magnetic fields and other related areas would be reviewed and adjusted until the anomaly is neutralized. If necessary, even a previously undiscovered planet is invented and its position, mass and orbital velocity calculated to explain the anomaly. These tools reveal the tenacity of scientific theories. Although falsifying observations exist, the theory persists. In retrospect, there may have been many cases in the history of science in which an experiment falsified an entire paradigm. However, years and decades usually pass between such an experiment and the lasting rejection of the disproven theory. It is only if these anomalies are piling up that the paradigm is questioned. If this process exceeds a certain point, we enter phase two, a scientific revolution. Scientific revolutions are taken to be those non-cumulative developmental episodes in which an older paradigm is replaced by an incompatible new one. So it seems that the conventional image of scientific progress conceptualizes science only in terms of what Kuhn calls normal science. But in between such periods of normal science, we see scientific revolutions taking place. And just as scientists irrationally clung to the previous paradigm, even though it was repeatedly refuted, they are now falling for the new one. Almost always the men who achieved these fundamental inventions of a new paradigm have been either very young or very new to the field whose paradigm they change. Obviously, these are the men who, being little committed by a prior practice to the traditional rules of normal science, are particularly likely to see that those rules no longer define a playable game and to conceive another set that can replace them. It was not Kuhn's intention to disparage the scientific enterprise, but to disabuse us of the unidimensional image of sober scientific progress. Judging from a historical perspective, science is not that rational endeavor, always objective and open to refutation. Scientists are human beings too. Therefore, they also cling to their beliefs and try to protect their learned convictions. Science likes to present itself as the sine qua non of objectivity. But we cannot escape the human condition. Science, like every cultural practice, is inevitably bound to human motivation. This is why Kuhn chose the term revolution. Why should a change of a paradigm be called a revolution? 
Political revolutions are inaugurated by a growing sense that existing institutions have ceased adequately to meet the problems posed by an environment that they have in part created. In much the same way, scientific revolutions are inaugurated by a growing sense that an existing paradigm has ceased to function adequately in the exploration of an aspect of nature. Like the choice between competing political institutions, that between competing paradigms proves to be a choice between incompatible modes of community life. According to Kuhn, the decision to launch a scientific revolution is not made rationally, but it is primarily influenced by extra-scientific factors, such as the nationality and personality of key scientific players. But what does this mean for the notion of rational scientific progress? Is this notion only a myth? What then is the hallmark of science? Do we have to capitulate and agree that a scientific revolution is just an irrational change in commitment? that it is a religious conversion, Tom Kuhn arrived at this conclusion after discovering the naivety of Popper's falsificationism. But if Kuhn is right, then there is no explicit demarcation between science and pseudoscience, no distinction between scientific progress and intellectual decay. There is no objective standard of honesty. But what criteria can he then offer to demarcate scientific progress from intellectual degeneration? Lakatos uses a different term for paradigms. He calls them research programs. And although he admits that Kuhn's observations are largely correct, he still believes in the notion of scientific progress. His argument is based on the distinction between progressive and degenerating research programs. Progressive research programs refer to what corresponds to the image of modern science. Degenerative research programs, on the other hand, are pseudoscience. For Lakatos, science is not defined by its method, but by its results. The main criterion for differentiation is not falsification, but the ability to generate accurate predictions. Newtonian physics is therefore regarded as a progressive research program. The physicist Halley, for example, predicted the return of a comet in 72 years to the day within Newton's framework. In addition, Newton was able to predict the existence of previously undiscovered planets, including their exact motion profile. In contrast, degenerative research programs only develop theories in order to bring them into line with already known facts. The predictions of degenerative research programs fail and their failure is subsequently explained and justified by auxiliary hypotheses. Their theories lag behind the facts. Marxism, for example, started out as theoretically progressive but empirically degenerate and ended up as theoretically degenerate as well. Has Marxism ever predicted a stunning novel fact successfully? Never. It has some famous, unsuccessful predictions. It predicted the absolute impoverishment of the working class. It predicted that the first socialist revolution would take place in the industrially most developed society. It predicted that socialist societies would be free of revolutions. It predicted that there will be no conflict of interests between socialist countries. Thus, the early predictions of Marxism were bold and stunning, but they failed. Marxists explained all their failures. They explained the rising living standards of the working class by devising a theory of imperialism. They even explained why the first socialist revolution occurred in industrially backward Russia. They explained Berlin 1953, Budapest 1956, Prague 1968. They explained the Russian-Chinese conflict. But their auxiliary hypotheses were all cooked up after the event, to protect Marxian theory from the facts. The Newtonian program led to novel facts. The Marxian lagged behind the facts and has been running fast to catch up with them. In the case of two competing research programs, scientists tend to leave the degenerating one and turn to the progressive one. If this attribution persists over time, the progressive research program replaces the degenerative one. Everyone leaves the sinking ship and a scientific revolution takes place. So there is scientific progress after all. It just doesn't look as neat and rational as we would like it to. So what do you guys think of this Kuhnian discovery? Does the important role that faith plays in science diminish science as an explanatory system? Can science even be done without faithfully sticking to core beliefs? Or is this leap of faith ironically a basic condition for scientific research? Write your thoughts down in the comments below. And if you leave a subscription, we'll see us again next week. Thanks for watching.